Good morning, good morning. Man, looks good today. You guys look great. Um, it's probably because time change, right? Everybody decided to come to the nine because it's like 10 or something like that, but, or however that works. I'm always confused. Anybody else confused by time change? I'm like, hold on, we're going up or back or gaining or losing. I'm not really sure. My iPhone changes it for me, so no difference to me whatsoever. I do not feel like I had an extra hour. I don't know about you, but it just feels the same to me. But we are uh, kicking off a new three-week uh, series today uh, based out of Psalm uh, 23. Now, I know we had a 5K yesterday, and that is not why I'm sitting down. I just want to go ahead and clear that up right now. Uh, this was pre-planned, so, um, but I'm kind of glad that I'm sitting down for a little bit, so that's good. But if you have brought your Bibles today, uh, I want to encourage you to bring your Bible for the next three weeks because that's where we're going to be for the next three weeks, just looking at Psalm 23 and what it has for us. There's so much in Psalm 23, and it's likely uh, one of the most read and quoted passages of Scripture in history. Uh, it really, really is. And it's, it's simplistic, yet it's, it's complex. It is, a, it is a psalm of light and life but it's also a psalm of valley and darkness. It is a psalm that describes the nature of God, but also the need we have for him. It's, it's written by King David, who was an experienced man, to say the least, a man uh, with plenty of life experience, but also he was empowered by the Spirit to pen the words of possibly the most famous uh, Old Testament scripture in history. So let's look at Psalm 23 today. We're going to read it through in its entirety. And this is, this is kind of a side challenge that, that I want to give just the church overall is to, for the next three weeks, every day, I mean, it takes like, I don't know, it takes like maybe 25, 30 seconds to read through uh, Psalm 23, maybe a minute. Um, I want to encourage you to read that Psalm every day and, and say almost like a prayer. And, and whether you have already memorized that, because a lot of people that possibly grew up in church, you memorized that already or you at one, once upon a time you did. Uh, but I think everybody could grasp a hold of this psalm in the next three weeks and memorize that and, and go to that as really a well for you in your life. Because uh, just over the past couple days, I, I, I knew it already, but over the past couple days of going over it, um, it's interesting how when you read Scripture and you think on Scripture, you pray on Scripture, uh, that there's just this calming peace that settles upon you uh, in, in the moments of the Scripture. So I want to encourage you to do that. I've experienced that. I hope you experience that as well as you read over Psalm. 23. But if you're ready to get into it, let's say amen. amen. All right, Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and staff they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Uh, I pray today that you would open our hearts and our minds to it. I pray that we would learn more of who you are May we understand more of our need for you. And I pray, Lord God, that truly you would anoint your servant to speak your word. May speak, speak nothing more, nothing less, only what you would have him to speak today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, I want to be very clear about the goal for this series. The goal is simply this, to learn more of the nature of God and also to learn more of our need for him. If you're taking notes, that is simply the goal of the series, uh, to understand and know and learn more of the nature of God and to learn more of our need for him. The book of Psalms uh, uses a lot of imagery. If you're familiar with the Psalms at all, you realize there's so much imagery in the book of Psalms. And Psalm 23 is of no, no exception. Its focus is the shepherd. It's on the shepherd and the sheep of his pasture. I always think it's, it's important as you're looking at Scripture to kind of look at the characters and look at what, what's the main characters of the text. And with Psalm 23, it's simply the shepherd and the sheep of his pasture. Um, I truly do believe that when you look at Psalm 23, the goal that we've already stated is the goal of the text, to help us, his people, to understand his nature and his heart toward us. Because the, the, the shepherd we're talking about here, it's not talking about me or a pastor, it's talking about 
It's talking about God. Okay, it's, it's not talking about us. We are the sheep, okay? We're, we are the ones that need led, amen. We are the ones that need guided. We are the ones that need direction in our life. And so I, I think those two main things really stick out to me as I read Psalm 23, his nature and our need for him. And I really do believe this is important. And I've heard people say this throughout the years, and it's a statement that stuck with me truly, is that how we view God and how you view God determines the direction of your life. Yeah. How many have heard that before? Like, how you view God, it will determine the direction of your life, what you think about God, who you think he is. But I want to take it a step further today and say, how you think God views you determines the demeanor that you carry in life. Does that make sense? Like, how you view God is so important. That determines direction. But how you think God sees you, you see, all of us today, we're sitting here, we think God sees us a certain way. We, we think God has certain thoughts of us this morning. Maybe some of you, you're all bummed out about what God thinks about you, or, or you, you don't think enough of, of who you are as a creation in Christ Jesus, a new creation in Christ Jesus. I really do believe that Psalm 23 will help us to understand uh, not only who God is, but also help you understand who you are and what he thinks about you. You can, you can tell a lot about a person with how they think God views them. You know, I've, I've met a lot of Christians, and it's very common for Christians, including myself, to have this idea that God is always upset with us. You know, he's always, he's always out to get us. He's always ready to, to come down on us. And you know, the fact of the matter is, God wants to lead us. God wants to guide us. God wants to direct us into these things he's talking about in this text. And that's what we're going to do today. We're really going to just break down uh, today the first three verses in Psalm 23 and uh, focus on just those today. So let's just take a look at verse 1. Let's check out verse 1 which is so vitally important as we move on to the rest of Psalm 23. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. So just that first line of Psalm 23 tells us so much. It, it tells us, number one, that he's Lord. And, and this is so important. He's not just Savior, he's Lord. Lord. It also tells us that he is shepherd. And I, and I love the terminology, he is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. So he is my Lord, and he is my shepherd. He is my Lord, and he is my shepherd. Okay? Understanding this verse leads us to the rest of the promises within this psalm. Are you with me? Like, if, if, we, don't, if we don't catch line one... We're going to miss the substance of Psalm 23, okay? We cannot claim the substance of this, of this chapter without the source of it, okay? I don't, want to, I don't want to get too far off track here because i got some ground to cover today, but I find that oftentimes that, and somehow I got notifications on this thing. I'm not really sure how. I'm a technology, I'm a, I'm a dumb with technology. I'm getting your notifications on this. you have any idea how to turn that off on this? You're... I know you guys got kids' church problems, but I'm finding out right now, so uh, it's all good. So I'm just going to hand this to you real quick. Just turn off notifications on that if you could for me real quick. Yeah, just in the moment, on the spot. Hey, Facebook Live, how you doing? You guys doing good? Well, hand it to somebody, and they'll, they'll turn off notifications for me. So, uh, But yeah, Psalm 23 is great. And just a little behind-the-scenes look at kids' church on a Sunday morning. Like, things happening in kids' church, just so you guys know. Uh, if it's your kid, we'll notify you. You will know. It's all good. Good. Maybe there was a number already flashing on the screen. But anyway, I was finding out about some stuff, and I was like, I'm either going to try to power through this, or I'm just going to take a moment. And I've decided to take a moment. So. But I will speak briefly on, on this idea of source and substance, because so many people, thank you, baby. Let's give it up for Holly. She did a great job. She's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> she was putting out fires up here on the front row and trying to pay attention and pretend to pay attention to me, and I appreciate that. I really do. Sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. You know what I mean? It's just the way it is. So, so listen, Psalm 23 has a whole lot of, of substance to it. And I find this happens so often that people will try to claim the substance of some scripture without the source of it. Okay, and, and we'll claim things, we'll say things, we'll repeat things 
without knowing what the source is behind it. And, and so often, I, it's, it, sometimes it can be frustrating because you know that at times people don't give God any part of their life, but yet, if you don't give God any part of your life, like if he's not Lord, if he's not shepherd, it's hard to claim all the substance of Psalm 23. There's a lot in Psalm 23, a lot of promise. And, and I think what people like to do a lot of times is claim the promise of God, the provision of God, the substance of God without realizing he's my source. Like he's actually my source. He's actually my shepherd. He's actually my Lord. Like he controls my life. Does that make sense? So I want to encourage you not only to, to lean into the substance of the scripture, but realize that it's all about him. Like he's the shepherd and he is the Lord. Um, the term shepherd, it carries so many characteristics. Protector, provider, guide, caring, friend, close. Like when we're looking at just the idea of shepherd, some of you um, may understand that term more if you're farmers or have a background in that or you've read on some of that. But even the idea of shepherd, like the imagery of shepherd, we, we don't connect with it, right? We don't connect with it a great deal because it's not something that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. What I find is that life, life gets most out of control when we try to take control. And that's why shepherd comes into play early on. Because as people, as humanity, we try to take control of our life. And God, out of the gate in Psalm 23, is reminding people, hey, I'm in control. I know you think you're in control, but I'm going to let you know that I'm in control. Uh, Jesus references this in the New Testament uh, when he says this, that the one who tries to keep his life will lose it. And the one who loses his life will find it. What Jesus is saying is, you need to lose control to the one who's really in control. Like, don't just totally lose control and give up all control. No, give the control over to the one who can lead you, to the one who can guide you, to the one who is ultimately in control of your life. Surrendering to the care of the shepherd is the safest place to be. I mean, sur surrendering to a God who is greater than us, who is all-knowing, who is all-powerful, that is the safest place to be. Sometimes people think that if they take control of their life, well, I got it. I know what's happening. How many of you know that we can never really take control of our life? One thing, one moment, one accident, one change in our day, it can totally destroy the idea that we're in control. One thing can totally revolutionize and even, I want to say, wreck your life if you feel like you're in control. How many know what I'm saying? He goes on to say, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In the shepherd's care, in the shepherd's care is the only place we can really find contentment. Man, isn't contentment lacking in our current day and age, right? Contentment, just to be at ease. And this, this speaks of more than our position and our, our possession of life. Please hear me that, that David was a wealthy individual, beyond wealthy, beyond wealth that any of us will, will ever know or imagine. He had everything a man could possibly want, but at times in his life when he tried to take control, even with all his stuff, he was out of control. So David was obviously not speaking of a possession or position in life. He was speaking of something greater than that. He was speaking of somebody he had surrendered to. To say the statement, I shall not want, this speaks of more than possession and position in life. David was, was not referencing his wealth. Um, he was not referencing the place he was actually setting. He was referencing a place where his soul was satisfied. I'm not sure if you've experienced this. I'm sure that many of you have in this room. But been to a place in your life where maybe... All was well or all was breaking down, but yet you were in a place where your soul was satisfied. And when, I, when I'm talking about a moment, I think that's the moment I'm talking about. Just, just briefly, even this week as I was going over this psalm, I just had a moment where my soul felt truly satisfied in the psalm. And we come and go out of that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like we, we come and go out of that in life. Like we can be focused. We can be focused on the fact that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And we feel a moment of contentment, and then boom, something happens to kind of snap us back into reality. But here's the truth. I believe that we can live in the reality of contentment. We can live in the reality that we shall not want. That whether we have all of our needs met or, the, or they don't feel like they are, we can truly be content in this life. 
the sheep in the care of the good shepherd, they don't have to worry about tomorrow. How many have ever worried about tomorrow? Anybody at all? How many have ever lied? If you didn't raise your hand last time, then you raise your hand this time. <clears throat> so we're all here together today now. So, you know, everyone worries at some point in life about something. But the sheep in, in the care of the good shepherd, they don't worry about tomorrow. And I love this, this quote as I studied this week um, from a well-known rabbi. He stated this, worry is dealing with tomorrow's problems on today's pasture. Worry is dealing with tomorrow's problems on today's pasture. Which, which leads me to the next statement in the psalm. It speaks of green pastures. He said, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Again, this is imagery that is probably off for a lot of us, including myself. I mean, I know, I know nothing about sheep, and I know th nothing about pastures. Um, so it's interesting to me when I'm looking at this text, I know there's so much in it that he, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And when you think of green pastures, you probably just like me, you think of, you know, uh, images of the rolling hills of Ohio, you know. Maybe you're driving out to Athens and you're seeing these, these hills in the distance, sun-kissed on the top. Or maybe you're thinking about the well-watered valleys of, of West Virginia where they're green and lush and uh, they look pretty. But the truth of the matter is we need to consider the places that David roamed. We need to consider the places that David uh, went to, where he was. And actually, I have a picture this morning of, of possibly some of these places that David went to and what it looked like. Now, that doesn't look too green to me. Does it look green to you? If it looks green to you, your eyes might need checked. It's okay. Um, sometimes we need glasses, and that's fine. Sometimes we're colorblind, and that's okay, too. You need to get that checked out. This is pretty brown. All right, now, historically, many pastures that they would graze and go to would look somewhat like this. It was, it was a lot of space and distance in between uh, the green pastures. Thank you guys uh, for that. But I want to give you an image of that because it, it kind of... It kind of makes us now ask questions. Okay, where's these green pastures that I'm laying down at and, and we're having a good time? Because that doesn't really look like a green pasture to me. You know, that picture changes the dynamics of how we read this text, okay? The shepherd and the sheep, they were, they were always moving, right? They're always going across these areas. And sometimes if you look at these, these mountains and these different places, you'll see these lines cut in the hillsides. And this is where sheep would go across. And the shepherd would lead the sheep back and forth into one pasture and to another pasture. And what would happen, even in a dry season, a lot of times, whether it be the dew from the night, um, would, would fall, even if it didn't rain, it would gather near the rocks, gather near these crevices and places, and these little sprouts or sprigs of grass would, would pop up, right? And that's where the shepherd would lead these sheep to. And once they were done grazing in that area, then the shepherd would lead them on to another area where this water would collect and where they would, where they would graze and then they would move on. So there's this, there's this constant moving, right? There's this constant moving. But when you found the green pastures, you were at a place of peace. You were at a place of rest. And guess what? You weren't thinking about the green pastures over here because you probably couldn't see them anyway but you're thinking about where you were in the moment. And man, don't we need to live like life like that a little bit more? Like a little bit more in the moment. And I think that's what that rabbi was saying when he said, hey, we, we try to, to think too much about the pastures tomorrow and we, we have enough, enough issues today, right? Just focus on what is right in front of us. Focus on what's in front of us. Uh, the shepherd and the sheep, the sheep grazed on the goodness of the shepherd's leading. This psalm is all about the shepherd's leading. And for the sheep to graze, they had to be led by him, right? They, they couldn't see it. They didn't know where to go. That's why we need direction in our life. If, if you think that you can navigate life on your own, you're going to find out quickly that it's not possible. There's always turns. There's always ups. There's always downs where you didn't know it was going to come. You didn't know it was going to happen. And I believe that is the, the, the difference between the life that is led by the good shepherd and the life that is led on our own. Because when we experience hurt, when we experience pain, when we experience triumph or tragedy or whatever it might be, we can't necessarily handle it, but we can if God is with us. And that's why I believe that people experience uh, even death differently when they have the good shepherd because they realize there's someone who cares for my soul. There's someone who is leading me. There's someone who is guiding me and directing my life. 
One expert on shepherding wrote that sheep do not easily lie down unless they're free from fear, friction, flies, and famine. Sounds like me, probably like you too, right? And it is funny because we are a lot like sheep. We really are, okay? I'm not calling anyone dumb today. I'm just saying that sometimes we can be close to being dumb sometimes in our life. That was such a political answer. You can be dumb sometimes, right? We can all be a little dumb. We, we, all, we all truly need led by someone greater than us. What I've found about humanity is that give it over to ourselves, we do a lot of dumb things. And sheep are skittish, sheep are fearful. If there's friction, even, even in the midst of the sheep, if there are flies, if, if they're hungry, sheep do not want to lie down in green pastures. The only way sheep will lie down if they're free from fear, friction of others, flies, and famine. Now, this man was obviously a preacher as well because he just did four F's in a row. And he just did like a preacher thing. I, I, I caught on to it. I'm like, dude, you can't fool me. You are a preacher. Fear, friction, flies, and famine. But we're a lot like that, aren't we? Like we're not, we can't be at ease and rest in green pastures if we're fearful. Some may not be here today because of fear. Some may not be here today because of friction. Some may not be here today because of of flies, of things that are bothering them in, in, in their mind, in their heart. Some may not be here today because of, of famine. They're just so dry and thirsty, they don't even know where to go or what to do. That is why we need to submit and surrender to the shepherd. And, it, and how many of you know it can change from one day to the next? Th this is why being led by God is a daily thing. I have found that I can have an incredible Sunday, and man, my Monday can be really messed up. How many know what I'm talking about? And like you can feel close to God or maybe there's a moment in his house, a moment in his presence with his people. And then, man, something happens Monday where you, you feel pretty far away from God. This is why it's so important. And I want to challenge you to even read this psalm daily to understand that, man, I am in the care of the good shepherd. This whole psalm speaks of a relationship, his, his continual leading. The next line says that he leads me beside still waters. He leads me beside still waters. You know, we, we need to pick up on the psalmist's descriptive language. I love how the psalms use, use words to really describe even further uh, what is being said. Still waters. Still implies what? It implies peaceful. It implies calm. It implies quiet. It implies rest. Uh, some would say that they're not experiencing that today. And I just have a question for you. I would ask, if you are allowing yourself to be led by the shepherd, if you're, if you're not experiencing calm, peace, quiet, rest, are you allowing yourself to truly be led by the shepherd? And that, that's not a, it's not a condemning question. It, it's a question I believe can bring us to a place of, of, of health, a place where we, re, re, we realize that it's possible we need to, to surrender something in our life to the care of the good shepherd. Uh, this psalm is a promise that we can experience peace in the midst of life's problems. This is what we need to understand about peace as Christ followers, that just because there's stuff that surrounds us, that doesn't mean we can't have peace. I mean, I, I can't really think of a time in my life where there's, where there's you know, a vast stretch where there's not something going on. How many know what I'm talking about? Where there's not something up in our life. There's not something we're dealing with. But we have a promise, we have a substance in this text to know that we can have peace in the midst of problems, in the midst of trial, in the midst of storms. Like some of you guys are dealing with, with heaviness in family and heaviness in life, but yet you have a sense of peace about you. And the reason is because you have a good shepherd that's caring for you and that's leading you beside still waters and that's leading you, making you lay down in green pastures. Are you allowing yourself to be led by this good shepherd? Because when we allow the shepherd to lead, we, we, don't, we don't force things in our life we follow. And if, if man, I, I think I've said this statement a lot over the past year or so, but if I've learned anything at all in this last season, it's one more thing I've learned, is, is not to force things, but to follow. Have you, ever, have you ever tried to force a lot of stuff in your relationship with God? Anybody at all? Anybody? Force maybe what he, he might be saying to you, force somewhere or direction you want to go. Let me just tell you, there's so much peace when you say, God, I just want to follow you. I just, I just want to follow you. I want to follow 
where you're leading. I don't want to force this thing. I don't want to force relationship. I don't want to, I don't want to force this stuff in my life. Lord, lead me where you want me to be. And that is where peace is. That is where peace dwells when we follow and we don't force. We are refreshed and we are restored by his leading. I love this line, he restores my soul. And possibly for you today, this is some substance that you need to grab a hold of. He can restore your soul. Just because you're a believer, just because you're a Christ follower, that doesn't mean there's gonna be moments in your life where you don't feel like you need restoration. Where you don't feel like you're in a dry and thirsty land. I want, I want to let you know today, if that's, if that's the way you feel, you're not alone. I guarantee you that. If you feel a distance from God, you're not alone. But isn't relationship a lot like that? Like it's, it's, it's always moving. It's always flowing. And I think that's where people, they have these moments where they just kind of break from all things faith because they go through this season of dryness. Can I tell you, that's what relationship's like. I mean, if you've been married for like 20 plus years, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like sometimes there's a seasons of love and sometimes there's seasons where like, I, I just want to punk kick you. You know, that's the first thing that came to mind. I don't know if it's holy or scriptural, but I just thought it was a good, good time for it. There's feelings like that sometimes, right? So that's what relationship is like. True relationship that is always growing, and always becoming better, goes through those seasons of ups, of downs, of valleys, of dryness, of times where uh, it's good, of times where there's bad. Sometimes in our relationship with God, we can feel like that, but there's a promise and there's a substance in this word that says we can be restored. There's a promise of restoration. As you surrender to the shepherd's leading, he restores. When this world and the journey of life take things from you, you can find restoration in him. Like sometimes the world can, can seem to take things from us. Sometimes the world can, can beat us up. Sometimes, sometimes we can experience some stuff where we feel like there's some things that have been taken from our life. Do you need restoration? If you need restoration, you can find restoration. It doesn't come from taking back control. Listen, this is not a self-help speech today, and I'm not going to tell you, like, you're enough, and you can do it, and you're worthy, and all this stuff. What I'm going to tell you is what you need to do is just surrender your life to God. Fresh and new. Surrender to him. He can. If you're a believer and you're feeling distant, you're feeling like you need restoration, pray that God would just increase the hunger for him. Not, not, a, not a drive to accomplish and conquer on your own. No, God, I need a hunger for you. I need a hunger for the things of God. I need a hunger for prayer. I need a hunger for your word. I, I desire you more than anything else, Lord. As we begin to press into God, as you draw near to God, he draws near to you. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He leads me in paths of righteousness. That's the next part of Psalm 23. You know, as we surrender to the leading of the shepherd, obstructions for stumbling are removed and we can walk in the path that he clears for us. That, this is what this is talking about, specifically when it comes to shepherd and sheep, that he leads me in paths of righteousness. The shepherd would go before the sheep and remove any big objects that would be in the sheep's pathway to walk. So when we're thinking about imagery, think about that, that the shepherd's going and, and removing these rocks, kicking these rocks out of the way, making the path straight, making the path clear so the sheep could go through. That's exactly what God does for us. He, he leads us in paths of righteousness. This makes me think of the part of the Lord's Prayer where he said, lead us not into temptation. You see the correlation there? Lead, lead us not into temptation. Lord, lead us not into a place where we will stumble. Lord, lead us not into a place where we're going to trip and fall. Lead us not into a place where there's going to be things that's going to catch us up and lead us off the path of righteousness. I want to assure you today that you can live right before God as you trust in his leading. I, I want you to understand, throw away the notion that you can never live right before God. You know, I, I just... There's, there's doctrinal differences with this when it comes to uh, church and, and what people believe. I, I just don't, I don't believe that we have to sin every single day and at all times and all moments. I just, I just don't think you can really find that in the word. And I think it also makes us feel better to think that. It's like, okay, it's 11.59, I'm getting ready to go to bed. Uh, I need to sin quick. 
Like, let's, let's make this happen. I can't think of anything that I've done today. Let's try to, let's try to do this. Listen, we can live right before God. I'm not, I'm not claiming you can live perfect because no one is, only Jesus is, but you can live right. You can live righteous before God. Lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Um, you can live right as you trust in his leading. It is possible to walk in paths of righteousness. How else will the world know the difference between the world and the church if the church does not walk righteously? If the church does not walk before God and there's a, there's a defining factor between your life and the life of the world. Right? So, so walking in paths of righteousness, it is of the utmost importance. We don't just want to claim some of the, uh, the stuff, the substance of Psalm 23 and leave out this. Because the, go- the goal is not just, just for us to benefit, it's for the kingdom of God to benefit, and it's for his name's sake. And that's where I want to land uh, today on that last statement, for his name's sake. Uh, yes, we live to bring honor and glory to his name. Absolutely. We are here today to glorify God. That's why we're here in this place, to glorify God and to enjoy his presence with his people. But... I want to take just a little different angle uh, with this last statement. You know, we, we live for him first and foremost because he lived for us. And he was willing to die for us. Like, if you're a Christian today, there's a reason why you're a Christian. Okay? It's not, it's not just because you were born into a Christian home or you were born a Christian. If you're a Christian today and you claim Christ as your Lord and Savior, you claim him as Lord and Savior because you realize what he did for you. You you realize that Jesus Christ went to the cross and and he took your sin and your shame and he he hung and bled and died on the cross for you and for me, for our sins. And then he rose again, indicating that he conquered death, hell, and the grave and our sin forever and all time. That's the gospel. That's, that's the good news. But guess what? That, that's why you follow him. Because you have that awareness. I, I became a Christian because I had an awareness that I was sinful and that I needed that sin taken care of in my life and there was only one way to do that and that was to surrender to the one who was sinless, Jesus. We live for him because he lived for us and was willing to die for us. We live for him and for his glory because of what he, what he gained for us through his care. Like we, we gain so much through the care of the shepherd. Jesus was referred to as the good shepherd. Why is that? Because he laid his life on the line for us. He, lay, he laid his life on the line for us. Th- this psalm, this psalm has so much for us. And if we could just get verses one through three, I truly believe it would revolution our, revolutionize our life realizing that we have a shepherd and he cares so much for us that he laid his life on the line. You know, that's what a good shepherd does. Yeah. You know, as John, as John 10 uh, tells us about the good shepherd, we see what the good shepherd really does. The, the Old Testament prophecy, if you will, of Psalm 23 is really about Jesus. We see this in John 10, 11 and 15. He said, I am the good shepherd. I want you to get this about Psalm 23. David starts out. He, he never refers to himself as the shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. It's important. The Lord is my shepherd. And David is taking the stance of a sheep. David, David is taking the stance of, okay, the Lord is my shepherd. Okay, so because he's my shepherd, I shall not want. Do you see that? But then Jesus comes in and and. John 10, and he says, I am the good shepherd. So he's letting the world know, hey, 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 I'm the Lord. I'm the shepherd. And then he goes on to describe his nature. I, I, I love the nature of Jesus. He goes on to say, the good shepherd, myself, lays down his life for the sheep. That's what a good shepherd does. These are the reasons why we follow him. That the good shepherd laid his life down for the sheep. He goes on to say, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming. I mean, are there wolves in our life? 
The Bible says that the enemy would love to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But if we have a shepherd. This hired hand leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. And again, he states, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father. And I love this line, I lay down my life for the sheep. Why, why do we come to him? Why do we wanna know him? Because he's a good shepherd. Because when there's things that try to come at us that we cannot control, things that, that, that we cannot handle, he steps in the way. When we're dealing with life's problems and situations and, and valleys and darkness, he comes in, he says, I, I'm the good shepherd. I know right now is difficult, but I'm gonna lead you from this. If you're in a dry and thirsty, or dry and thirsty place, you, you, you feel like you have need of something, he wants to lead you beside still waters. He wants to make you lie down in green pastures. He wants to restore your soul. Do you see it? Do you see the nature of God, the nature of God? Do you see our need for him? Do you see his heart for humanity? Do you see how he cares for us? You see how, how you view God determines the direction of your life, but how you think God views you, it's gonna determine the demeanor of your life, the demeanor that your life carries. So in light of Psalm 23, I think we should probably be able to smile a little more. Don't you agree? I think that we should be able to rest a little more. I think we should be able to calm down in the midst of life's craziest of situations because we know there's a shepherd that leads us, there's a shepherd that guides us, there's a shepherd that directs us, and he wants to, think of that, he wants to. Hopefully you came here to give God praise, honor, and glory today, but hopefully you came here to say, Lord, lead me, Lord, guide me, Lord, direct me. Let's stand to our feet this morning. I'm excited about Psalm 23, uh, and, and I, I really do believe this, that beyond, beyond Sunday morning, because how many know there's, there's so much more to the Christian life beyond Sunday morning? Yeah. Beyond Sunday morning, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be praying for our church, praying for you as you're, as you're reading Psalm 23, that we would truly just take it on, just, just truly understand all of the substance that it has for us. I'm gonna be praying for some of your restoration. I'm gonna be praying for some of you who feel distant and dry and thirsty. I'm gonna be praying for just nourishment and life to flood in your soul. I'm gonna be praying that um, we're, we're gonna see just health arise in this church, spiritual health arise in this church, physical health arise in this church, emotional health arise in this church as we together collectively, as we give ourselves to what he's given us. It's a gift. Like his word is a gift. Begin to pray, God, give me a hunger for your word. Give me, give me a hunger to pray, just to have a moment with you, God. Beyond anything else, may I hunger for you above and beyond everything, Lord. Father, today I thank you so much. Thank you for your people. Thank you for being able to come together and, and, and read your word today. I pray that we would understand it more. We would understand our need for you. We'd understand your nature. I truly do pray today that you would lead, guide, and direct us. If there's, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, God, I pray that just this text, this message has helped them to understand how much you care for them. And if you're here today, you don't know Jesus and you want to, just pray even right now. You can say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need you. Save me. Make me new. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. Father, I pray that you would lead, guide and direct and you would draw people closer to you this morning. Draw those who may not know you close and draw the believer close today. I pray we'd find encouragement, we'd find strength, we'd find comfort in you, Lord Jesus. We give you all praise, we give you all honor, we give you all glory today. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. And A.